Would like your attention, please. Well, we're in for a treat this afternoon. We have a distinguished panel here, led by the Commanding General of U.S. Army Forces Command. As General Sullivan talks about topics of mutual interest, reserve component in a persistent conflict environment would be one of those topics. Uh, General Thurmond, no stranger to the topic, has worked in the field, he's worked in the Pentagon, he and his team assembled here know the deal. So it is indeed an honor for me to present to you the lead of our panel, General J.D. Thurman, U.S. Army Forces Command, CG. Well, good afternoon, and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started here. But first off, uh, thanks for coming in. I think we have a very important topic that we want to discuss this afternoon. But before I start, I want to introduce the panel. And to my uh, left is the Honorable uh, Thomas uh, Lamont, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. Uh, sir, it's great to have you sit here with us today, uh, and thank you for what you do every day. The Chief of the Army uh, Reserve, uh, Lieutenant General Jack Stoltz, is to uh, uh, Secretary's left. And to Jack's left is Lieutenant General Tom Miller, uh, the Commanding General of First Army. And everybody knows General Miller uh, because he's the guy that is really executing the executive agency uh, job for training and mobilization of the reserve components. Uh, as part of Forces Command. Uh, to his left is the Acting Director of the Army uh, National Guard, uh, Major General Ray Carpenter. Uh, and to uh, General Carpenter's uh, left is the, I wanted to get an Adjutant General to sit on the panel because I think that's very important. And that's uh, Brigadier General uh, Tim Orr, who is the Adjutant General for the state of Iowa. So uh, we got a group of great folks up here this afternoon. And, uh, and as we go through the presentations, uh, we've got a few slides we'll show of how we see things and what we're trying to do. And then at the conclusion of, of the presentations, then it'll be open for questions. If there's something that you've got that's burning you that you have to ask the question, then ask it. Uh, because as I said, this is an ex a very important topic. I will tell you as the chief force generator for the Army, we cannot meet Army requirements without proportional representation and contribution of the reserve components. And we'll talk more about that here in a second. So without further ado, I would, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Tom Lamont. Sir? Thurman. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. And thanks to General Thurman for uh, taking a lead to assemble this uh, August panel on this important topic. Now, General Thurman, uh, J.D. counseled me uh, late yesterday that you're not here to give a speech. So I'm going to call these my remarks. I want to take a few moments to discuss the policy implications associated with transitioning the reserve component into an operational force and how the transformation will assist the Army in achieving more cost-effective total force. What has become obvious today is the Army, in particular, needs to achieve a more cost-effective total force through an increased reliance on the reserve components. The wartime experience of the past decade validate the need to institutionalize the policies, procedures, and legislation conducive to achieving the most efficient utilization of the total force. The contribution of the National Guard and Reserves to our nation's defense efforts has risen to almost five times the level it was before 9-11, and its workload has increased over seven 
times. Today, over 74,000 Army Reserve component personnel are on active duty support requirements across the globe. The Army Reserve component account for 51% of the Army's military end strength for 16% of the Army's 2010 base budget. Don't think we're the only ones that know those numbers. The people over on the Hill know those numbers too. And while there may be some quarrel on occasion with those numbers, uh, I think most would suggest that they generally are validated numbers. Now, however, the Army did not make this major shift to increased reliance on the RC deliberately. It was a matter of drift rather than decision. As General Casey has previously noted, quote, our reserve components are performing magnificently, but in an operational role for which they were neither designed nor resourced. In October 2008, Secretary Gates published a directive for management of the reserve components which require the secretaries of the military departments to, quote, manage their respective RCs as an operational force. The Secretary of Defense directive further explains what he meant by the term, the RC as an operational force. And I think you'll see some discussion of that definition here today. The Army is now developing policy and legislative actions to implement Secretary Gates's guidance and codify the transformation of the Army's RC into an operational force in order to provide proportional support to the Army's force supply model, ARFRGEN, of a core headquarters, five division headquarters, 20 brigade combat teams, and 90,000 enablers. Let me point that out. Of the five division headquarters, one is RC. Of the 20 brigade combat teams, five of those are reserve component. Of the 90,000 enablers, 49,000 will come from the reserve component. All are necessary to support combatant command requirements through 2014 time period. So it's important to understand ARFRGEN simply does not work without the reserve component. Now, programming decisions are required in the near term to ensure RC forces are sufficiently ready to support the Army's force generation plans. Without sufficient resources in unit management, collective training, and medical dental readiness, the RC will not be ready to support the plan 152090 force supply construct. Moreover, these investments are required within the base funding to ensure the RC achieves a level of institutional transformation that cannot be achieved by year-to-year -year allocation of resources from OCO, from Overseas Contingency Operation Funds. It's got to be in the base. Finally, the Army requires recurrent, assured, and predictable access to the RC to support the ARFRGEN model. Now, how do we do that? Well, we believe a new limited Title X authority would provide the Secretary of Defense and the military departments a mechanism for employing the RC to support peacetime force generation requirements such as theater security cooperation missions, rotational forces to Europe or Korea, and other force generation requirements that are longer than 30 days in duration. Such an authority would allow DOD components to program and budget, program and budget for a greater use of the RC to meet steady state requirements within the base budget. My office, MNRA, is coordinating with the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs and other services to develop a revised unified legislative budget, ULB, proposal for the FY13 cycle. If the ULB is approved by Congress and signed by the President, the Army could begin programming for the increased use of the RC as early as FY15. Uh, very, in very general terms, I'll tell you what the proposal is. Right now, it, it calls for authority of the Secretary of Defense to call up to 50,000 reserve component soldiers 
not just Army, all services, 50,000, for up to 270 days. There's been some discussion. That originally, we had it at 30,000 and 180 days because we didn't know how much we could ask for and actually get. And we thought at one time perhaps we needed to start a little, uh, a little less than what we really needed just so we could get it accepted over on the hill. And it's still going to be a fight. But after we reviewed all the uh, other options and listened to our sister services, we did up that to 50,000 in up to 270 days. Lots of different reasons for that. Marines typically have a nine-month tour. Uh, we were looking at, at two training um, missions, frankly. Uh, so the 270 just sounded better. And so hopefully we can move forward on that next year. Now lastly, as part of the codifying of the operational reserve, MNRA is developing a draft Army total force policy for the Secretary of the Army to approve <clears throat> as an Army directive. The utilization of the Army's total force necessita necessitates the development of a Secretary of the Army level policy for the most efficient utilization and integration of the total Army. Integrating the Army's three components as a total force requires the Army to ensure a proper balance of capabilities capabilities between the active component and the reserve component, utilize reserve forces in the most efficient manner, and employ the total force using a common set of principles. The Army must continually evaluate and optimize the capabilities between the AC and the RC to achieve rotational capacity of one to two on active, one to five on the RC by type of military capability to, facil to facilitate the integration of the ACRC forces. Arfrogen plans should ensure ACRC forces hopefully will train together and are deployed as integrated force packages to the maximum extent possible and, and within the same time period of utilization. Procedures and authorities for validating pre-deployment readiness of the force packages should be the same for AC and RC units and personnel. So in summary, over the past 20 years, DOD policymakers have asked a series of questions regarding the RC. In 1990, it was, will they come? In 1995, will they stay? In 2001, can they fight? In 2009, are we working them too hard? The Guard and Reserve answered each time by surpassing expectations in terms of mission accomplishment. So I now ask you and our panel members, do we have the right policies in place to use our RC forces to the best advantage in an era of persistent conflict? Thanks, I look forward to our uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, sir. Okay, uh, a couple of things up front that I want to tell you as a Force Com Commander. I've been directed as a Force Com Commander to get the Army on a supply-based force generation construct. And that's at a one to two, one to four. And I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about what the Army looks like in terms of total capability. But before I do, there's a couple of things, and there's, about, there's four key documents inside of Forces Command. You know, I am the chief force generator. If you read AR 1087, Army Regulation 1087, signed out by the Secretary of the Army that designates me as the executive agent for force generation. The other title that I have, I am also the executive agent for collective training in the Army. Uh, General Casey appointed the force com commander uh, and gave him that responsibility last year. But a couple of documents. We uh, have a campaign plan, and I'd say it's about 90%, but it has task, and it really sets the azimuth of what Force Com's about for the next five years. And it's our intent to update this every year, because a plan has to be updated, and you have to cut a frag over to it every now and then when things change. But this is how we see the conditions, and it's over there on the table. The other key document is last week I signed out 
the ForceCom training uh, and leader development guidance. And that's available for you uh, to take a uh, look at. But it talks about getting us back to full spectrum operations. It talks about getting back to the fundamentals and basics of training and leader development in there as a result of uh, after we've been at war for over nine years, we got to get ourselves back to doing some things other than counterinsurgency uh, type training. And that's what it talks about. The other thing is in November, we will publish ForceCom Circular 350-1. And that's the training under Army Force Generation. And for the folks that are in this business, you need to take a look at that. The next thing that's going to go along with that is a CEF white paper, a Contingency Expeditionary Force. And as you're, if you're under R4Gen, the two mission sets, once you go into that available force pool of R4Gen, is a DEF, which is a, a, uh, a deployed uh, expeditionary force, uh, i.e. Iraq or Afghanistan, a directed mission, or a CEF. And I'm going to talk about that and show you the, the examples. But as we get started here, give me the first slide here. This is how we see the definition of an operational reserve component and what it means. And that's the definition. So when we talk about it, that's what it says. And just a couple of key things. Accessibility. It is essential we have access. And some folks ask me, why are you worried about that? Well, let me tell you, because I know what the law is. I know what 12301 says. I know what 12302 says of U.S. code. And I know uh, what, what we have to do to get access in to get uh, our reserve components. And we cannot operate without the reserve components. And I'm going to show you that here in a second. The other thing is properly organized, manned, and equipped, and trained. Trained to one standard. And I think we've made a lot of progress on that as a result of where we've been in the, in, 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 uh, uh, the war, but there's more work to do. And that's getting the policy set, but it also means the funding that has to uh, migrate out of the overseas contingency operating funds into the base budget, particularly if you are a CEF formation. Uh, fully integrated multi-component and capable of full spectrum operations. And the whole notion here is to preserve that citizen soldier ethos. Next chart. Now, here's the total operational commitments in the combatant command. And it starts right over here with the Sea Bernie Force. As you see what's highlighted here, these are reserve components right now today that are in our combatant commands, whether it be in NORTHCOM, UCOM, and they're highlighted, SOUTHCOM, CENTCOM, and over in PACOM, and we've highlighted here those formations of uh, reserve components that are uh, deployed around the globe. Now, what's all that mean? That's roughly 62 brigade combat teams, or uh, our, our brigades, 62 brigade combat teams and brigades, of which 20 are BCTs, uh, and that breaks down with the BCT 17 AC 3 RC. And then 38 other brigades as part of that, which is 12 RC is the proportional contribution on that. Now, next chart. This is what happens if you don't have access. You will not achieve the rotational goals of a one to two and a one to four. And I'll tell you, there are certain capabilities in the United States Army that do not achieve a one to two. Medevac, we're in, we just deployed a medevac company inside of a year that out of 10th Mountain back into Afghanistan. There's high demand for Army aviation, and I'll tell everybody this. Aviation units are in high demand, and we must get access to them. And it's our intent to use reserve component uh, aviation to support, whether it be in Sea Smurf or some of these other requirements out there that are, that are uh, in other combatant commands. And so those are some things there that I just highlight. Civil affairs, engineers, uh, transportation, logistical assets, high demand items, as well as military intelligence. 
So this is why this is important when you start looking at this. And, and believe me, we have gone and looked at all enabling capabilities across the Army. And, and, it, and we may have to do some rebalancing and some reshuffling. But I do know this. Every time you tinker with force structure, it's going to take you a time to build readiness back. Because you don't build that overnight when you change a reserve component formation. I know that. It takes you two years when you change a regular Army formation, active Army, and you're in the, up to uh, three to five years for RC. That's, and it takes money, and it takes people and training and all that to do that. So we've got to be very conscious of that if we decide we want to do something like that. Next chart. Now, demand forecast. As we move into fiscal year 12, we are using fiscal year 11 to change the policies for, from the institution, manning, equipping, some of the uh, uh, internal policies to the Army from the institution to get us set on a supply-based model. So this shows unit requirements, and over time, we know we're going to draw down out of a rock. Uh, we got to be down below 50,000. We had to be down below 50,000 this past September, and by 31 uh, December of 11, the President says all out as well as the Iraqi Security Force Agreement. That said, you can see that we will have less units with a deployed uh, expedition in the deployed expeditionary force category. So that generates more CEFs. Those are the definitions. Contingency expeditionary force, deployed expeditionary force. That's the elements that go in that available force pool. So up here in the cloud shows what we know right now with our best guess at Forces Command of what's going to be available. And so as you can see, one core, four divisions, 11 brigade combat teams of which three are RC. And eight multifunctional brigades, three are RC, 35 uh, functional brigades, which there's 10 RC. That's our best guess right now. So what do we want to do with those formations? I'll be the first to tell you, we can't go back to prior to 9-11. I know that. I used to be at the NTC when we brought the enhanced brigades out there. And so we've got to capitalize on our combat experience and make sure we're maintaining the readiness that's necessary for a force if it's called upon, because I believe it has to be fully integrated. That said, we've got some missions that we could put in the CEF categories, some of our reserve components. It could be with war plan alignment in one of the combatant commands, theater security cooperation events, uh, uh, JCS, Army exercises, homeland defense, or institutional support. But I see in this category we're going to have to look at, at maybe thinking a little bit different about how we employ and deploy when we're our SEF unit. And we're going to work with the, with the National Guard and the Army Reserve to do that as uh, over the next few months uh, as we get ready to go into 12. And so we're not wasting soldiers' times and we're, when we're, we're maximizing the greatest amount of readiness. So that's how we kind of see it. Next chart. Now, here's what the FY12 operating force in the Army looks like. And this is why this is important. Dark green is active Army. Down the side of this chart shows the, t the number of formations we have in the operational force. The uh, lime green is Army Guard. And the lighter green is Army Reserve. Up here at the top is what it looks like. That's about 835,000 that's in the operating force that we can put on the R4 Gen model. And so that's, that shows you what your Army looks like. Next chart. So when we talk about proportional contribution, this is what it means. If you're going to be, at, and that's 1.1 million men and women, of, of 835,000 of that being in the operating force, that means of what uh, Mr. Lamont already talked about, at a 1 to 2, 1 to 4, that's what it looks like with that one core, five divisions, and 20 brigade combat teams, and 90K of enablers. At Forcecom, we have already gone down and laid out that enabling capability, as I talked about. And we have that set to be put on the force generation construct. 
every unit uh, uh, source uh, rec uh, code uh, that identifies every unit in the Army. That's what it looks like for the RC and the amount of contribution. Now this is what should get your attention. 70% of Army, all Army CSS and CSS right now is in the RC. By 17, 73% will be in the RC. That's the way the Army uh, force structure looks like. And then engineers will go to 77% of all engineer units in 17 right now will be in reserve components. 82% of all transportation units, 82%. So right now that just tells you we have got to be able to get into the reserve components or you end up having to rebalance again and change the force structure and move it back into the AC. So that's what it looks like. Uh, now, one to three, one to five. I don't see us getting to that right now based on what our crystal ball tells us with the demands until about FY15. That's when I believe we, we can uh, go to a one to three, one to five. Next chart. So what General Casey has directed us to do is put the Army on a rotational model and build a versatile mix of tailorable and network formations that are operating on this rotational schedule, uh, uh, rotational uh, uh, model here. Inside that, this is what R4Gen looks like. Reset, train, ready, and available. The RC has a 12-month reset period. And then it has train ready one, two, and three, and then they go into the available force pool. What we want to do at, after an extended deployment, or, or as soon as that unit goes into the reset period, at about uh, return plus 180 days, we want to give that reserve component unit a, an available force pool date of what they're going to do and what we want them ready to, to be able to execute. That's what it, our intent is. And that goes, this is what we call the mission force as you go into the available force pool. So a third of the operating force inside that army will be available. Our 4 gen is like a moving sidewalk. And what we have in Forces Command, we have automated that so you, with an R4Gen sync tool that we can look at every unit in the Army and see where they are as we're flowing through the force generation cycle. So you say, well, what happens if something happens in the country? It is our intent to build a surge capability of another Corps, three divisions, 10 brigade combat teams, and another 41K of enablers and, and designate that as a surge force. Okay, now, that's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult because we're just now kind of lining ourselves up on that and manning and equipping end up being the long pole in the tent because this is not going to be easy to do what we have, uh, have started out doing. But we believe with the reserve components with timely notification, if we tell you what we want you ready for and how uh, we want you to present yourself at the notification of sourcing. We believe we can get it done. So you got about half of the operating force here and a third here. That's about 58% of the force. Next chart. My final thoughts. We cannot squander away what we've learned. And we will, I tell you, if, if we say we're going to go back to the way we used to do business, I think we're going to fracture the force. That's Thurman's personal opinion, okay? Having been around a while. So we believe we've got to really work close together, you know, put all this great intellectual energy into this to make sure we're doing the right thing for our soldiers. Uh, the other thing that I think is maximize effective and efficient use of our training resources. You've heard the uh, secretary talk about the efficiencies. We have got to understand that that spigot call overseas contingency operations funding is starting to turn off. So we have to work together as an Army to maximize these training uh, uh, facilities and our training capability. And I'm talking about our combat training centers, our ORTCs, our operational reserve training centers, and what we have across the land so we can maximize the use of those and make sure we're getting the most out of them. It is the intent uh, of the chief for Forces Command to run a training summit 
so we can take a good look at our training resources. Uh, General Miller will talk about the mobilization and training because we believe that that we need to continue to streamline what we've learned in mobilization. As a matter of fact, I've designated him as the lead for mobilization inside of ForceCom to come back to me and tell me what we need to do to improve our mobilization. And that, that crosses across policies and demobilization because we've learned a lot of lessons out of that. Uh, what we're doing, the continued use of the RC, requires us to speak with one voice and have a strategic communications plan of what it is we're trying to achieve and accomplish. And then we need to inform the American people because I think the value of having our reserve components out there as part of that total force, uh, when, we're, when we're pulling those soldiers from the heartland out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the the US, United States, it just really speaks volume. And I've, I've been able to get out and see a lot of, of, uh, of the communities, and I know they're very proud of their soldiers out there, but I just think we got to do a better job of communicating. Uh, we talked about combat experience, and this whole deal speaks to one team, a totally uh, and fully integrated effort. So with that, that's what I wanted to talk about, and I'm going to go ahead and turn turn my uh, uh, rest of the time over here to General uh, Stoltz so we can continue. Okay, thanks, sir. Well, first, uh, uh, what I'll talk about a little bit is where we've come from and then uh, a little bit about where I see us going. So, next slide. First and foremost, just to, um, a lot of you already know this, but I wear two hats. I am the Chief of the Army Reserve. I'm also the Commanding General of the Army Reserve Command. As such, there used to be two headquarters. There was the, what we call OCAR, or they designate themselves the Ocarians, and then there were the Usarkians. And they spoke two different languages. Uh, they didn't <coughs> communicate with each other. They all had their own personal policies. They did their own awards and decorations. And when I walked into this job, I found out there were two entities out there. And we said, we can't be a operational force and operate like this. Because we got a group up here at the Pentagon that is doing strategic planning and policy without having a clue what the impact is on the operational force. And we got an operating force down there, operating out there, without informing the people up here what they need in terms of resources, policies, or, or other things. So I said, we're going to create one headquarters. It's just going to be in two different locations. Also, at the same time, the Chief Staff of the Army said, we're going to go to an enterprise approach. And we're going to have a human capital, a material, a readiness, and a services and infrastructure enterprise. And so I said, OK, now I've got to organize this one headquarters in two locations, and I've got to do it along enterprise lines. So real quickly, I took my Deputy Chief of the Army Reserve, one star, Brigadier General Leslie Purser, and I said, you're the human capital enterprise for the Army Reserve. You are an army of one. You have no one working for you. You no, have no authority over anyone in the Army Reserve, but you've got to shape the human capital. And she said, I can't do it by myself. I said, good, I'll give you a colonel. And I gave her a colonel. Now, over time, we said we can't operate that way. What we have created is, yeah, I'm the commander. I've got a DCG support. And now I got a DCG ops. I'm using a divisional model. Two star billet down in Atlanta, DCG support with my human capital, who now owns the G1, the family program, senior leader development, my material core enterprise, who owns my G4, G8, and all the staff. My readiness is my G357, who owns all the G3, and then my services enterprise, who owns all that responsibility. So I've given them authority over those entities on these staff, and I've organized along a support line and an operational line. Then I looked at the field. How is the field organized? I've got four regional support commands. What's the middle word? Support. So I said, okay, my regional support commands are going to be aligned under my DCG support. The rest of my commands are operational and functional. They're going to be over here on the ops side. So effective one October this year, We've organized along those two lines of effort, support and operations. Next. Now, how have we 
organized as a force. Currently today, I'm authorized 205 to grow to 206,000 by uh, FY12. I actually have more than that. Uh, we've already achieved our end strength. But if you look at the way the Army Reserve is organized, first and foremost, I've got a lot of functional headquarters that are a part of the operational force. Some of these are regionally aligned, like the 377th aligned to Army South and Southcom. Some of them are rotational and are rotating actually through various theaters of operation. Then we took our operational force that's under these functional commands and we broke it into five years, five packages. And we said, okay, here's how that works out, 24,000 a year. Guess what? One five twenty ninety, our portion is 24. Pretty good math. And we said in that 24K, here's what you get. Uh, civil affairs, engineers, medical, MP, transportation, CSS, signal, all those capabilities are enablers in this level of packages. So now I can come to General Thurman and say, every year, this is what I can give you, trained and ready forces. But there's another big portion of my force that's sitting down here in the generating force, 48,000. Some of those are training commands that are up kind of trade up the initial entry and the tasks MOS producing. A lot of, large portion of that is belongs to Tom Miller, his training force for the collective training for the Army. A lot of those forces are not just in the generating base. I keep about 10,000 back here in CONUS mobilized, performing training, performing medical missions, performing garrison support. But a lot of these forces down here also rotate through Iraq and Afghanistan as part of Sistica, Minsticky, and those types of foreign army training missions. We just recently, you may have read, deployed a group of female drill sergeants out of the 95th Division, along with a female company commander that just graduated the first OCS class of female officers in the Afghan army. That's part of that generating force, just happened to be doing generating missions in Afghanistan. So here's how we're arrayed, and we will grow the operating force to 150K over the next several years. Next. Now, how do we operate that force? Well, as General Thurman already indicated, we divided into five years of training, starting with reset and working our way through train ready one, two, three, and into the available year. Back here, we start out working really individual, as does the Army when you come out of reset, and gradually work our way up through squad, platoon, company level, all the way to hoping to get to company level of proficiency and some battalion level of proficiency before we get into the available year. If we're going to be a deployed force, we turn it over to Tom Miller. He takes it through into the MRE and makes sure that they're trained, ready, and, and capable as a collective unit. If we go into a contingency force, then we're down here waiting for the mission. Next. Now, how does that look in terms of platforms? Because one of the things we said is we've got to get very efficient. We can't afford to try to do everything everywhere. We developed three major training platforms in the Army Reserve, Hunter Liggett in California for the West Coast, Dix in uh, New Jersey for the East Coast, and McCoy in the Midwest. And we enable those by putting some, some organizations there for pre-mobilization training. Tom Miller put some organizations there for post-mobilization training pretty efficient. You've got both entities right there in the same location. We, we start down here with reset and we have things like task training to get MOS proficiency. We have our regional training sites for med, for maintenance. We start working our way through there and they will, then they'll start hitting some of these platforms either as an individual sometimes for MOS training, as a squad or platoon for that level training, or over here you can see CTC-like events or even certification where First Army's got that unit sitting at Fort Dix or Fort McCoy and they're in charge of getting the certification for them. But it's turned into a very efficient, very smooth operation. Next slide. And here's the proof. What I did is I took some units that went in 05, 07 time frame and some units, that, same units that went again in 07 to 10. You can see Back in the 05 to 07, we had a pretty standard post-mob training mo model, right? Everybody gets 90 days. Everybody gets 90 days because 
Tom Miller could not predict at what level of training we would show up. And so he has to worst case it. We were manning the unit just in time, equipping the unit just in time, and training the unit just in time. And so let's put 90 days in here. And then for a, a, a sustainment command, one-star command, we need even more to get them to a one-star level of collective uh, 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 expertise. Now look at what we're doing. We're knocking 37, 32. Look at the 100th Battalion. They're, they're my infantry battalion out of the Pacific, Guam, Saipan, Samoa, and Hawaii. We spent 174 days the first time we deployed that unit in the MOVE station. Tom will tell you, the last time, we sent them through an RTC at Fort Hunter Liggett. They got all their warrior leader tasks. They got all their medical. They got all their dental. They got all their RFI. They did all their weapons qual with full RFI. So when they showed up at North Fort Hood, they're pretty well ready for the collective piece. It took them 71 days. We got 103 more days of bog out of the 100th Battalion for their last trip to Iraq. With the uh, sustainment command, this is actually the 143rd, not the 316th here, but we went from 168 days to 37 days post mo So how did we do that? Well, we got very efficient with our RTCs again, but we also said, what's the most important thing we want to train the ESC? Not every individual soldier. It's that leadership. So let's bring the leadership team in. Let's take them to Fort Lee, Virginia, and let's put them through a leadership training exercise where we can run them through the same experience they'll have in theater. In fact, we've replicated the COIC there, and we can get the leadership trained. Then we'll bring the rest of the unit together. And so we do the training for the individual soldiers you know, at, at the MOVE station, and here we knock off over 137, or 130 days. And they did a magnificent job in, in Afghanistan, the 143rd, when they went there. Next. Now, what are we going to do for the future? How are we going to employ this for, force for the future? Well, one model is we do exactly what we're doing now. We mobilize them all for 12 months, if that's the demand. But if the demand's not there, I submit to you, we've got a lot of different options of how we can use this force. Next. One, you got the force going to the deaf, we already know. They're going to be deployed. We know what their mission is. We know what the length of time is going to be. The only variable is boots on the ground. But what about these guys down here? As we get more and more of this 24K coming down this way instead of going this way, what are, we're, the concept we're working upon, and General Thurman already talked about it, is theater security cooperation, theater engagement. You've got to use the force. If we're going to put them through this five-year model, if we're going to invest in the training, and we've got the soldiers who say, use me, we've got to figure out how to do it. I'll give you a couple of excursions real quick. Next slide. What if we took an engineer battalion? We've run it through the four years of the Arpagen model. Now they're in the available year. The Army needs them. General Thurman just told you, 70-some percent of the engineer capability is going to be in the reserve components, so you better have them trained and ready and have access to them. But what are you going to do with them while they're in that contingency force? We've got theater security cooperation requirements that are out there. This just happens to be one of them. A lot of you work in uh, Nuevas Horizontes, Fuentes Caminas. We've got missions in AFRICOM, same thing. What if we took this battalion and said, okay, during your available year, one, you're going to be a contingency force. You're going to be trained, ready, and standing by if something happens in North Korea, and you got to go. But in the meantime, we're going to use you as a theater security cooperation, theater engagement force. We're going to use you one company at a time. We're going to put the one company downrange in, in the Philippines to do the construction, the theater engagement that PACOM wants us to do. So at any given time, I've got a battalion with three companies sitting in the force, contingency, ready to go. And I've got one company downrange. And I rotate one company after the other, after the other, after the other. So I give USERPAC PACOM 360 days worth of theater engagement capability. I give FORCECOM a full year with one battalion and three companies of contingency force capability. And I give my soldiers a utilization tour because they actually get to go and do something and utilize their skills. And then after that year, they rotate back. Next. 
we can do the same. I can overlay unit after unit after unit, foreign army training, logistics, whatever. We're doing it right now with our medical missions. This year we had soldiers aboard the USS Mercy, last year aboard the USS Comfort. Today I've got soldiers in Colombia. Earlier this year in El Salvador and Guatemala, they're doing medical support missions. If you talk to the mill group people down in Guatemala,